Simeon, it is a great pleasure to join you all for the fifth European Union Arab Forum and greetings from our CNN regional hub here in Abu Dhabi, where I have witnessed firsthand the development of relations between the two blocs, but specifically between Greece and the UAE that started in business but is growing into a strategic alliance. This is a critical time to explore EU-Arab relations, developments in and around the Eastern Mediterranean, and Greece's potential as a business and trade hub for the region that can, of course, encompass North Africa. In that spirit, I conducted an in-depth interview with Prime Minister Kiriakos Mitsotakis, and we start with how to grow EU-Arab relations. Let's take a listen. Well, I think, um, John, there is uh, uh, an increasing uh, understanding within the European um, uh, Union that uh, we need to play a more active uh, uh, geopolitical role uh, in our part of the world. And of course, when we look at our part of the world uh, in the slightly broader context, uh, we cannot afford not to have um, a strong partnership uh, relationship with what we call the Arab world in its, in its broadest possible uh, dimension. There are lots of, of challenges um, uh, we are facing, and I'm not obviously just talking about uh, uh, COVID, but uh, you know, issues um, uh, such as um, uh, migration, which is a very important topic for uh, all uh, European um, um, uh, countries, issues of regional development, issues of energy. Uh, and we need to establish the proper context in order to be able to address these issues because these are also issues of, uh, uh, of priority for the Arab world. And of course, for, for Greece, this makes that much more sense given our um, geographic position uh, on the map and our traditionally strong ties um, uh, with, the, with the Arab world. We are an Eastern Mediterranean country. We're concerned with tension in the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm sure we'll discuss this uh, throughout our, um, uh, our topic. So we feel we can be you know, a natural bridge between what's happening in Europe and what's happening in, in the broader context of the Arab world. Well, it's interesting because senior ministers here in the region, specifically the UAE, which you're going to be visiting uh, in the next couple of weeks, have said that Greece can define a very special role uh, as a bridge between the West, i.e. the European Union, and the East or West Asia in the Gulf. How are you defining that on this visit? What do you think you'll get accomplished? Well, uh, I visited uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE um, last February, right before COVID. Uh, and especially with the UAE, we've, we've set an ambitious uh, target to significantly improve our bilateral relationship, both on the economic but also on the geopolitical side. Uh, and it'll be an opportunity to take stock of the progress that we um, uh, have made and to, to establish, to really lay the foundations for what I do consider to be a, a strategic partnership. We've seen a lot of progress since uh, in terms of uh, significant interest uh, by uh, capital from the UAE to invest in Greece. Greece is becoming a much more attractive investment uh, destination. And frankly, when I visited, I was surprised that uh, we hadn't done more in terms of our relationship with the UAE uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, and I think that we also look at the world um, uh, through, through a relatively similar lens also regarding what's happening in the Eastern um, uh, Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, in that respect, uh, I have uh, high ambitions um, uh, regarding this uh, relationship, and I'm sure it will go from strength to strength. Uh, the Abraham Accords here, you have to watch with amazement because uh, months ago I couldn't even place a phone call from the Gulf to Israel, and now they're signing a series of MOUs. Uh, how will this uh, impact the Eastern Mediterranean, for one, and how do you see it playing out for the Palestinians? Does it give peace a better chance sitting at the table uh, and seeing growth and development first and peace thereafter? Look, uh, as far as the, uh, the accords themselves, uh, it, you know, it was a, you know, a, a significant uh, step in the right direction and also a proof that uh, um, countries that have had long lasting differences, deep divisions can actually overcome them uh, and reach um, uh, you know, peaceful resolution that is to their, to their mutual benefit. And I think also uh, works to promote uh, overall regional peace. As far as the Palestinian issue is concerned, you know the position uh, of the European Union uh, in, in favor um, uh, of a, of a two-state um, uh, solution, and uh, Greece is, is very much consistent with what the European Union has said in, in that regard. But because we have a strong relationship as Greece with Israel, we have a strong relationship with the UAE, um, that, of course, I think creates 
uh, more uh, opportunities for a broader regional cooperation between uh, our, uh, our countries. And this is certainly uh, a topic I'm looking forward to discuss with the leadership of both the UAE but also of Israel. You mentioned the European Union position on uh, the Palestinians. Uh, the Minister of State of Foreign Affairs here, uh, Mr. Gargash, was saying you can't leave an empty seat and expect to advance the cause. And that's why the UAE wanted to go ahead with the Abraham Accord, which was seen as quite a radical initially and seems almost normal today. Do you agree with that strategy by the UAE? We welcome the, uh, the Abraham Accords. Uh, and I think it is, a, it is clearly a step in uh, the right uh, direction. And to the extent that it is uh, a, an agreement, a peace agreement between two countries we consider as allies, uh, because as I told you, we have strong relations both with um, uh, Israel and the, uh, the UAE, uh, it is, of course, uh, a most welcome development. I wanted to talk to you about the recent attacks both in France and Austria. Uh, heinous attacks, and it uh, relates to the Muslim uh, community. Was uh, migration mismanaged in the European Union in the last 20 years, and some that decide to migrate don't respect the cultural diversity uh, in Europe, uh, nor their religious freedoms? And how do we correct it, if you will, or can you? First of all, we're all sh shocked, uh, and we, there are no words to, uh, you know, to strong enough to condemn how horrible these uh, uh, attacks uh, are. Uh, it would probably be slightly simplistic to uh, you know, tie them to, um, uh, to migration. And uh, uh, Europe has been home to millions and millions uh, of, uh, uh, of Muslims who have been living uh, peacefully uh, in Europe. Of course, there are issues uh, in, in various countries, not necessarily in Greece, that have to do with, um, uh, with integration, but we're not talking about that here. We're talking uh, about a horrible terrorist uh, uh, act, uh, acts perpetrated um, uh, by very specific uh, actors who seek to challenge the European way of life. Uh, and uh, a European way of life that is, uh, uh, that is open, that uh, uh, tolerates uh, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, uh, this is who we are in Europe, and uh, frankly, we are not going to um, uh, uh, stand uh, uh, idle uh, when we are faced with these um, uh, with these types of um, uh, of attacks. But uh, this is not just a, a question regarding how Europe has dealt with uh, uh, with, with integration um, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of of Muslim communities. It would be uh, it's 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 wrong to to view it through this. Uh, uh, through this lens. Um, you know, as far as uh, uh, Greece is um, uh, concerned, uh, we have always been uh, a, uh, a, a country that has been ex extremely uh, open uh, and tolerant. Uh, we have uh, uh, a small Muslim minority uh, in north uh, eastern Greece that is, uh, I, I think, relatively well integrated into Greek society, extremely peaceful. And, and we're doing our best to make sure that we offer uh, equal uh, opportunities to all Greeks, uh, uh, to the overwhelming Christian uh, majority, but also to our small um, Muslim minority. Ten days ago, we witnessed the full force of Mother Nature with the earthquake that struck uh, Izmir and the island of uh, Samos. And it led to direct uh, talks between yourself and President Erdogan of Turkey. Uh, do you trust this process of resetting uh, with Turkey, and can it last as a result of that catastrophe? Well, it, it was very natural for me to call President um, uh, Erdogan, uh, offer my condolences, and also offer Turkey any any help that they um, uh, might, uh, you know, have have requested at the time. Given that the catastrophe in Turkey was much, uh, the damages in Turkey and the loss of life, which was much much bigger than what happened. Uh, in, um, uh, in Greece. I think it was a very cordial and, and, and friendly telephone call. But frankly, John, we shouldn't be talking just uh, when there is a catastrophic uh, earthquake that sort of reminds us that there are forces of nature that uh, transcend uh, uh, all of us. Uh, we have reached out to Turkey repeatedly since I uh, became prime minister. And uh, what, we've, what we've gotten in response was a series uh, of highly, highly uh, you know, provocative uh, uh, activities in terms of challenging um, uh, our, um, our sovereign rights, uh, unilateral exploratory activities between what we consider to be Greek uh, exclusive economic uh, zone. And we've told Turkey something very, very simple. Let's sit down, talk, discuss, 
Uh, but there needs to be a precondition, and the precondition is that you don't engage uh, in activities that we consider uh, is violating our sovereign rights. Uh, and we should discuss what our differences are, and we have one main uh, difference uh, with, uh, with Turkey, and that is the delimitation of our maritime zones. And if we cannot agree, we should go to the international court. But unfortunately, uh, and in spite of uh, efforts also made by Germany, uh, because the Chancellor tried to, to mediate between Greece uh, and, and Turkey, we haven't seen any real progress. But the European Council has taken a, a decision and has made it very, very clear that it expects significant progress by December. It will take stock of the issue in December. And uh, if there is no significant progress, there will be consequences uh, for Turkey. And of course, the Turkish economy is not particularly strong these uh, uh, days. So it's really up to Turkey to determine whether it wants a productive relationship uh, with Europe or whether it wants a confrontational relationship with Europe. If it chooses a second path, it should know that there will be consequences for uh, Turkey. Uh, because I think the Europeans have understood that this is not just a difference between Greece and Turkey or Cyprus and, uh, and Turkey. Uh, what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean affects Europe as a whole. This, what's, hap what's happening on the migration front uh, affects Turkey as a, as a whole. Uh, when Turkey tried to use migrants and refugees last March as geopolitical pawns to put pressure on Europe, this doesn't just affect Greece, it affects Europe as a whole. So this is no longer a dispute between Greece and Turkey. I think it is a dispute between Europe and Turkey. Uh, and uh, 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 Turkey should be very much uh, aware of the, uh, of the fact that uh, uh, it's not just about solidarity by Europe to Greece uh, and Cyprus. It's also about the vital strategic interests of the European Union uh, in a part of the world that is uh, crucial for our um, European interests. What do you think is his end game here? And I don't want to be too provocative, but I do want to ask, uh, eventually, would you be willing to share energy resources if discovered? Uh, is that a possibility in the future? Well, this is not something we do, um, um, uh, we do discuss, uh, uh, John, because uh, we first need to, to, to determine, um, uh, uh, you know, delimitate our maritime zones in a fair and equitable manner. This is, you know, the number one uh, priority here, and uh, we haven't been able to, uh, to do so um, uh, for uh, many decades. But I just want to point out that uh, this government, uh, uh, our government, has signed a delimitation agreement with Italy. We've signed a partial delimitation agreement with Egypt, and we have agreed with Albania to go to the international court and let the court decide how we want to delimitate our maritime zones. So we have proven that there is a solution to this problem if you stick to international law and good neighborly relations. So really, it's, um, uh, I think, frankly, it's, it's Turkey that doesn't want to play uh, by, by the rules uh, uh, here. And that continues this constant sort of provocative uh, uh, activity. And as I told you, um, the, the deadline has been laid out by the European Council. This is no longer an issue that just affects our bilateral uh, relationship. It affects the overall status of the relationship uh, between uh, Europe as a whole and Turkey. You know, he has declared, President Erdogan, that he wants to be a net exporter in five years. Uh, he's made discoveries, as you know, in the Black Sea, but that is impossible for him to be a net exporter without the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so how do you find a settlement? Only through international mediation then? Well, uh, I don't see uh, another way but to, uh, to sit down uh, and uh, agree. And if we agree to disagree, uh, if we cannot find a solution, as I told you, we, s we sat down with Egypt and after 14 years we did find a solution. We consider it to be an equitable solution. Both countries took a step back because that's the way international agreements are, are done, are reached at the end of the day. Uh, but um, uh, if, um, if Turkey doesn't uh, want to, uh, to play by, uh, by the rules, uh, it's very difficult to envision uh, a solution that's, uh, that's currently found. But we should also consider the fact that uh, you know, all other countries in the region are cooperating. There is the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum. So why is it that all countries cooperate and, and Turkey is the one country that is uh, the, you know, the one that is causing problems? Maybe they should give the Turkish leadership some pause for thought. We're not all after Turkey. This is, we never try to exclude Turkey. 
Uh, I want to be very, very clear uh, with you and your, uh, and your audience. It's, it's Turkey that is almost excluding itself through its, uh, its behavior because all other countries have found a way to cooperate. So I think this should tell us something about you know, attitudes towards uh, uh, cooperation and willingness to find acceptable solutions in our part of the world. Is there strength in numbers, Prime Minister? Uh, you have uh, this force of Israel, Egypt, Cyprus, Greece, uh, backing by France, uh, Chancellor Merkel serving as the mediator, uh, the United States uh, indicating its support. Is that a wall you're comfortable with that keeps Greece secure against Turkey? We, we have full confidence uh, in ourselves. You know, in our armed forces, we may be a smaller country than Turkey, but we have a, we have a very strong deterrent. And that was always you know, the purpose of investing in our armed forces. But I do need to point out, yes, that there is an international alliance um, uh, being formed that is, uh, is, uh, is concerned about Turkey's role. And again, I wouldn't want it to be this way. I'm the last person who would want uh, a Turkey that is actually a disruptor uh, in, uh, in our neighborhood. I, I do aspire to have friendly relationships with Turkey. They will always be our neighbor. And I think the, the ties between our people are strong uh, and, uh, um, and, 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 go back, um, and, and go back many, many centuries. Uh, but of course, uh, Turkey has also, uh, also needs to see the world through the same, the same lens. I do need to point out that there has been a change in U.S. policy also vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. The State Department has been quite strong in its language of condemnation uh, of the Turkish behavior um, uh, over, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, over the past um, uh, months. So again, everyone seems to agree that Turkey seems to be doing something wrong here. And of course, uh, uh, my job um, uh, is also to build strong alliances. So this is what I'm doing. Uh, how about the uh, choice that we see for president in the United States? Uh, has Vice President Biden given indications that he'll be an active player in the Eastern Mediterranean and understands uh, the reliance and the viability of the future of NATO? Well, we're sort of in an awkward uh, position here because we're taping the, the interview. By the time it'll be, um, <laughs> it'll be played, you probably know who the, um, um, who, the, who the president is. So allow me not to comment on this until I know um, uh, who, 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 who the president is. But I, what I do want to point out that, uh, uh, that there is a, a bipartisan concern in Washington about Turkey's role. And I think this is also shared by the security establishment um, in, in Washington. So this is not just about who sits in the White House. It's about what the, the bureaucracy and the administration uh, thinks uh, is actually happening in our part of the world. You know, I spoke to a senior intelligence chief from Eastern Europe who told me two years ago that the Eastern Mediterranean was the most volatile place, most dangerous place uh, on Earth and kind of uh, vulnerable to war, if you will. Can conflict be avoided when you have potential natural gas assets at play here that everybody wants a piece of? Of course. We should, I mean, we should be able, because, you know, if, conf if conflict, God forbid, were to break out, it would be a lose-lose. Um, um, uh, situation eventually for, for everyone. I mean, uh, but, uh, and that is why, again, I, I, I do want to stress that we've, we've found ways to cooperate and, and countries in the region have found ways to cooperate. And if I were to return to your um, uh, initial questions, uh, you know, if Israel is, is being able to, to cooperate with, uh, with countries that were considered sort of quote unquote mortal enemies, uh, what is it that doesn't allow you know, us to cooperate uh, you, know, I, uh, uh, you know, 80 years ago, uh, in, uh, in 1930, you know, eight years after a, a devastating war uh, between, uh, between Greece and Turkey, um, uh, um, uh, which ended in 1922, in 1930, the leaders of the two countries signed a peace and friendship agreement. Uh, and then, you know, Prime Minister Venizelos actually went to, um, uh, to Ankara and, and signed a peace agreement um, uh, with, um, uh, with, Ke with Kemal Ataturk. So countries have the way to overcome their, um, uh, their, their differences, uh, as long as they approach uh, international relations not as a zero-sum game. It's never a zero-sum game. That's an optimistic uh, tone there. I wanted to talk to you about your uh, latest maneuver here on the COVID-19 second wave. You've called for a three-week 
lockdown. And I want to know first the initial reaction from, from Greeks because they did follow the rules of the government uh, in the last wave. Uh, will you get that same sort of support or is there fatigue? And also, how do you balance the lockdown with trying to keep the economy moving, Prime Minister? This is, is crucial at this time. These are, these are difficult decisions, and everybody wanted to avoid a full lockdown. But I think it's happening more or less uh, everywhere in Europe. Uh, and we took the decision probably earlier than other countries. By earlier, I mean when we saw, when we, when we got the first indications of exponential growth, um, we took the decision to put the country on lockdown for three weeks. Uh, we were ahead of the curve in March. We did remarkably well during the first wave. Uh, but the second wave has hit us all with, uh, uh, with, with much greater um, um, uh, strength. Uh, and uh, uh, in that respect, uh, what we're doing now was the only solution to make sure that we won't have uh, pressure um, uh, on our healthcare system, which would uh, uh, at some point um, uh, cause us real difficulties. But it's the same. The same is happening everywhere. We're still doing better than uh, most European countries, but I had to take the decision now because I knew I probably would be forced to take it at some point. I prefer to do it now, have it for three weeks, have it act as a circuit breaker. Hopefully, we'll reopen in December to make sure that we salvage uh, something from the, you know, from the Christmas uh, uh, season. And of course, we are, we've supported the, uh, the economy. We've pumped a lot of money into the real economy, supporting businesses uh, and uh, especially workers um, by picking up through furlough schemes, by, by picking up their, their wages. The fact that Greece now has a lot of credibility and allows us to, to borrow on the international capital markets with record low interest rates, uh, as you know, uh, gives us the, the liquidity cushion to support the real economy, which is what every country, frankly, needs to, uh, to do in these extraordinary circumstances. And, and of course, we're also looking uh, at Europe to quickly finalize um, uh, the, the details of the Recovery and Resilience Fund. So come 2021, we'll have access to significant um, uh, European funds to help us uh, restart the economy and, and have the economy grow again. But I also want to point out that in the midst of the crisis, uh, we've had significant foreign interest for investments in Greece. And I'm not just talking about interest in traditional sectors, such as, um, uh, for example, um, uh, hotels and tourism, where we see a lot of interest also from Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, Abu Dhabi Capital has invested, for example, in, in fish farms, uh, cutting edge technology uh, in terms of, uh, um, uh, of uh, food supply. Uh, Microsoft announced uh, a huge investment in building uh, uh, three big data centers uh, in, uh, in Greece. Volkswagen, a few days ago, signed an MOU with the Greek government to turn one of our islands into a prototype uh, smart um, uh, mobility island. Uh, really cutting edge work uh, in, in technology, in green transformation, in sectors where we think Greece should really take a leadership and we all, where we also see lots of synergies with the Arab world, especially issues um, uh, around clean tech, around food security, uh, these are areas where we can do much more uh, in terms of cooperating with capital from the Gulf. I was going to ask you, in fact, is the COVID-19 pandemic masking what is a very promising window for recovery with some $37 billion earmarked from the EU Recovery Fund? That should give you a good foundation once you get through the second wave. It will happen. Uh, Don, I'm sure that the recovery is going to be ro very robust. Uh, and as soon as we're going to have a vaccine, and I'm confident that we will have good news um, um, soon. Uh, and as you know, the European Union has signed vaccine uh, deals with all promising uh, companies. Uh, what I notice also in Greece is that savings go up. So um, uh, I think people will be looking to spend once the, the pandemic is over. And businesses will be looking to invest. And the smart businesses are already investing because they know that the pandemic is going to be over. They know that Greece has a reliable, pro-business, uh, reform-oriented government. They know the opportunities in Greece. So they're eager to place their chips now, e even before the pandemic uh, actually comes to, um, uh, to an end. That's what smart investors do. They, they're ahead of the curve. Well, in fact, we saw Microsoft make a move. Pfizer setting up a research center. Volkswagen uh, working on autonomous vehicles here. Uh, you're approaching foreign direct investment in a very different way. 
So green technology, for example, uh, high-tech startups out of Athens and Thessaloniki. Yeah, we just had the previous prime minister. Yeah, we just had a recent acquisition by a leading American company of our leading Greek uh, high-tech data center. We've had acquisitions of startups uh, in Greece for uh, you know very. Uh, these are very significant investments. So there is a high-tech um, ecosystem that is being that is actually um, uh, emerging out of Greece. And of course, we have a significant advantage, John. We have so many talented Greeks abroad who are actually looking to, to return to Greece, provided Greece offers good job opportunities. And in the post-COVID world, there will be winners and losers. I'm convinced about that. I'm pretty sure Greece is going to be on the side of the winners. Uh, and uh, in an environment where you can work out of anywhere, um, why not work out of Greece? Uh, at a time, Greece is a, is, is, is a safe, connected country. We're going to be one of the first countries to launch 5G, one of the first countries to complete our 5G uh, uh, auctions. We're a member of the European Union. We are ideally situated at the crossroads of three continents, uh, which is particularly relevant also from people uh, in, uh, in the Gulf, but also people from Eastern uh, Africa. So I intend to make this a success story. Uh, COVID has derailed everyone. But I see the opportunities uh, behind this uh, uh, crisis. And for the first time, we've also been able to mobilize significant European public um, uh, capital. Uh, the European Union is borrowing as a supranational entity to support member states. So, uh, of course, I have to deal with day-to-day -day crisis. And it is very tiring uh, and uh, very difficult to track this virus that keeps uh, surprising us. But at the same time, I keep my eye on the medium and the long term. We're implementing very meaningful reforms to make sure that once we're done with COVID, uh, the Greek economy is going to take off. You've mentioned 5G and the concerns that, that America has, and Europe for that matter, uh, on Chinese technology and data control. Will you follow the European Union line and go with a European company because of those concerns uh, with China and Huawei, for example? No, first of all, our operators are European companies, so we don't have any Greek operators, and they make the decisions at the end of the day. Uh, we will follow, I'd say, the European, the European path, and you'd expect us to follow the European mainstream on this issue. But we're going to be one of the first countries to launch uh, 5G. Uh, we've also been rather innovative. We will use part of the proceeds from 5G uh, to set up uh, a specific equity fund that will invest, uh, co-invest in 5G uh, applications. So we don't uh, uh, sort of pump everything into the public uh, uh, budget because we see the potential uh, uh, of Greece as, as a country that can uh, play its own role uh, in the high-tech uh, ecosystem. You know, there was a lot of concern when Costco came into Piraeus, and I actually covered the story three years ago, uh, and perhaps using Greece or Italy, where it has a large presence, as Trojan horses into the European Union. What's the Greek experience? Because there's been a lot of Greek local hires, better than 1,500. Do you have the paranoia that the U.S. has about this foothold into Europe? Frankly, no. Um, it's been a good deal for Costco. It's been a good deal for Greece. And there are issues, and you know, we've also agreed with Costco, that they're slightly behind schedule in terms of delivering some of the investments that they were supposed to do in the port, but I'm sure we'll resolve this, uh, uh, this issue. Uh, it's been, uh, Pyrrhus has, has been transformed into a very successful uh, port. We've made it very clear we want to make it you know, the largest port uh, in the Mediterranean. It's a natural entry point for goods um, into the eastern uh, and central Mediterranean. We want to turn Greece into a logistics hub. Uh, you can't argue with, uh, with geography. It will always take you know, eight or nine days less for ships from, uh, from the Gulf or from, the East, uh, from East Asia to reach, uh, uh, to, Europe, to reach Europe. So I'm not willing to, to give up this uh, opportunity for, for the country. And uh, you know, John, nobody's going to take the port away and leave with it. Huh? So <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a long-term concession agreement. This is what we've, uh, uh, we've signed. Uh, and uh, we see this as a win-win uh, project. Uh, a pet project I was always thinking about for Greece is being the financial hub of the Mediterranean, which could take in North Africa, and it never was done by previous governments. Do you see potential here to exploit the geographic position and this market on its own? I can tell you that even you know post um, um, uh, post Brexit, we see interest for 
from financial institutions to set up a presence in, uh, in Greece. And we are, we're offering them uh, enough uh, incentives to be able to actually um, do that. So Greece should also be a, you know, a financial uh, center for the broader region. And again, I, I, I'm, I, I place particular emphasis on the fact that Greece combines uh, you know, a safe, connected, uh, uh, and geographically appealing location because of what we are, because it takes you know, four hours to fly to Abu Dhabi, whereas it would take eight hours to fly from, uh, from London to, um, uh, uh, to Abu Dhabi, with the fact that we offer a fantastic quality of, uh, uh, of life. Uh, and uh, these, I think these issues are, are becoming increasingly important. And we're also, we've proven uh, also um, by dealing with the COVID uh, epidemic that we are a safe country. Healthcare, by the way, is an area we're investing a lot. Why shouldn't Greece be a regional you know, healthcare center um, for the broader uh, region? We have a booming pharmaceuticals uh, industry, but we should also be much more active uh, in, uh, in healthcare services. We can be incredibly competitive to attract uh, um, uh, customers, not just from the Gulf, but also from the rest of Europe. And one final question for you, Prime Minister. What did you learn through the experience of that gradual opening in the summer uh, to allow visitors to come in, measured, mainly Europeans, uh, over time? And what will you apply to the next summer, uh, having uh, faced down COVID uh, and not knowing when vaccines roll out? Look, uh, we opened up to tourism uh, by taking all the precautions. We had extremely limited transmission from visitors into the, into, into the country. We, had, we were very sophisticated in terms of who we tested. We used very sophisticated algorithm in terms of who we actually uh, tested. So we actually were innovative in terms of big data uh, and machine learning solutions uh, in, in addressing the testing um, problem. We, you know, we, the, the second wave of the epidemic essentially uh, um, hit us after, after we finished with our tourism season. So there was no correlation between what we did. But hopefully, um, hopefully by, by next summer, you know, the root cause of the problem uh, will have been addressed because otherwise there will be reluctance uh, from people to travel. We'll be smarter by then, we'll smarter, there'll be more testing, we'll be even smarter in terms of uh, how, we, how, how we handle the problem, but we need to address the root cause. And the root cause uh, of, of the problem is only gonna be uh, you know, significant and very quick vaccination. Um, of, um, uh, of the European population so that they can actually um, uh, travel safely. And I do hope that if, if the news from the companies are successful, that um, uh, you know, by, 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 by spring or by, by summer, um, uh, you know, people will be able to travel uh, safely. We've set up, we've done all the preparatory work in terms of our supply chains and making sure that once we get the vaccines, we will uh, vaccinate our populations very quickly. We, we're very quick in terms of vaccinating. Um, we'll be vaccinating almost half of the Greek population uh, against the flu. There is no anti-vaccination movement in Greece, thank God. Um, people are, were actually quite eager to get vaccinated um, uh, against the flu, and I'm sure the same will happen with, uh, with COVID. I told people I'll be the first to do the COVID vaccine, not because I want to be the first to be protected, but because we need to send a signal that if the vaccines are actually approved by the companies, that they're definitely uh, safe and, uh, and effective. I appreciate all the time, and it's great to have you for the uh, EU Arab Forum uh, and also for our on-air work. It's great to have you. It was uh, terrific. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Excellent. Take care.